this lecture, being the first in our STS courses, is the history of liberal education. The readings for this are in your Uvle uh, classroom. Uh, the primary reading is the one that was written by the journalist uh, Fred Zakaria, which you will find in your module one in your Uvle. Okay, let's start. So the reasons for liberal education and education in general, one of the first questions that we need to ask is whether we, we need to get educated. And what is the reason why we have to get educated? So why do you want to get educated? The first reason, and this is quite uh, an unexpected answer to the question if you ask me, and it's a perfectly valid uh, answer is to get a job. Uh, in these days and day and age, uh, we have to get an education so we can prepare for the professional career track that we envision, and that would occupy a huge part of our adult life, the productive part of our adult adult life, and also getting the job okay, and practicing a profession also has an impact in society in general because our professions are meant to contribute something to society. So there's no, not much of a problem really to say, I want to get educated because I need to get a job. That is for practical reasons, a good answer. The other answer is to develop virtue and excellence, which the Greeks called arete. Now, what is this arete? Okay. Now, uh, since we are in this pandemic situation, um, which, in which we can visit cultural venues, Okay, uh, across the Katipudan Road in, or C5 in the Diliman area is Ateneo de Manila University. And Ateneo has a cultural and creative hub called the Arete. Okay? During normal, in the normal situation, okay, uh, I would request the students to, to visit the cultural hub and look at the exhibits and the concepts behind it. And the reason why the Ateneo de Manila University called their creative hub as Arete is actually in, it's a homage to the Greek idea of excellence, virtue, and goodness. So the Greeks had this idea of education which develops the virtues of excellence and goodness okay, in a person. Now, this is so important in the intellectual environment of the West. Okay? This is Raphael's famous painting of the School of Athens, which is in the Vatican. Okay? Uh, if you look at the painting here, uh, all the Greek scholars are on different planes. Okay? So uh, the scholars on the here, on the topmost step of the Temple of Knowledge, uh, are the philosophers like Socrates here and Plato, okay, and Aristotle, the mathematicians and the and the geometers? These are the mathematicians who who study geometry and rhetoric. Here are on the second level. It just shows you there is a hierarchy in the knowledge or in the knowledges that the Greeks. Uh, were particularly interested in. Of course, philosophy is so important for them. No? Mathematics and geometry and music are important too, okay? but it's a little bit lower than philosophy. Now, if you look at the composition here, all the philosophers are actually in on one level here. There is no hierarchy that one philosopher is higher than the other. Of course, if you can look at the painting here, you would see that uh, Socrates is at the middle of the composition because he was regarded as a very important philosopher, at least in the Renaissance in when this painting was first uh, created. So what can we gather from this idea of education in Western civilization? The answer would be, and it could be, that education actually is a sort of democratizing force. Okay? It tends to make you all equal in the search for knowledge. 
and this uh, equality in the in the search for knowledge is quite an ideal even today. No, if you look at the painting here, there are no women, okay, because women are not expected to get educated. It's very unusual for a woman to get educated in ancient Greece. Okay, uh, the women most likely, or as a matter of fact, the women were uh, the were keeping the home. Okay. And in some cases, they are the priestess at the temples. Okay, that's it. You know? In ancient Rome, the women had more roles, but still they were subservient to the men. Okay? Uh, it is not unusual to know of uh, Roman women who had a very influential role in Roman society. They had education, but it was an education that was domestic, okay? depending on their husbands, if their husbands were quite liberal with education that the women would have been educated. Okay. But a woman cannot be educated just because she was a woman or she's a woman. Okay. Uh, the woman would have to be, would have the consent of her man, okay, the husband, or if she's unmarried, her father. So this whole equality ideal okay, uh, was only for the men, but of course, over the millennia, uh, the role of women became very important that we need to get equal opportunities for women to get an education. Okay? That's one of the uh, legacies of a liberal type of education philosophy. Now, as you have seen in the earlier slide, uh, the philosophers are on one plane, okay? And it tends to show you that they have a certain sort of role as citizens, okay? And the role of a citizen in a democracy, okay? The citizen should be able to vote, but the citizen should be educated. And during the time of the Greeks and the Romans, the citizen was a male, a man, okay? Women never had the right to vote. But the role of education is actually to prepare the citizen, in that case, men during that time, to take on the responsibilities of democracy. Even today, this is an ideal in our society, in any democratic society. An educated citizen is most likely able to choose the leaders they will elect, okay? to lead their government. Okay. An, an educated citizenry will have a problem with democracy, really. Okay. So the Greek ideal, in summary, okay, a broad education is a requirement for the obligations of liberty. Okay. And so the, law, the Romans called it liberal, okay, in Latin, okay, liberal. Okay which means it's educate, uh, education for the free man. Okay? Now, in, in, in Roman society, you cannot gain citizenship unless you are freed. Okay? Well, uh, a lot of the citizens of Rome started out as slaves. Okay? There's a lot of body of research that says, and one of the, one of the leading researchers here in recent years is actually Professor Mary Beard. Perhaps if you Google her name, you get her YouTube the documentaries on YouTube about her, uh, her research on ordinary life in Rome. In her videos, you would learn that uh, much of these, much of the Roman citizens were used to be slaves. Right? So they were uh, serving their masters who are Roman citizens. And the masters essentially gave them Roman citizenship by setting them free. Okay? And it is only after they are set free that they can get an education. But in many cases, it's the masters who are liberal enough that the slave has to be educated in order to serve the household in a very responsible way. So many of the slaves, when they got, uh, when they got freed by their masters, had enough education. But education to fulfill all the important promises 
of education, you should be a free man. So liberal education was really meant for the free citizen. Later on, a new idea would come up in which education is some way by which you can be free. Okay, so look at the slaves of Rome. Okay, some of the some of their masters educated them, so it was a pathway to full citizenship, to be free. However, there were disagreements even during the Roman period and during the Greek period in history. They were really talking about what's the purpose of being educated. Well, of course, arete is important, but remember, arete was an abstract concept even for them. No? What about the practical, uh, practical side of arete? Okay, so Plato and his students, including Aristotle, uh, said that education is a search for truth. Okay, fine. Okay, so you want to know something about the world, and that's what education is <clears throat> all about. Isocrates here, <laughs> this man here, this is Plato, and this is Isocrates. According to Isocrates, education is for arete. Okay, it's not just for the search for truth, but to build the virtues of excellence. Okay. And so the question now is liberal education for is it for is it it for another purpose or is it an end in itself okay uh, if education is for a purpose then it's preparing you for a certain role in life in the case that we have it now it's preparing us for our professional careers during the roman and greek period perhaps to be a, a responsible leader of your society, which means you can get elected to the Roman Senate or any of the councils that uh, govern the cities of Rome. Okay? And so uh, that's an important question which is still being debated upon today. Okay, is it just for uh, getting, getting a diploma and getting a landing a good job or is it to make you into a better person? Really, the whole idea of arete is to make you into a better person. However, the Romans being more practical in these matters, okay, they, they viewed education as a practical, uh, practical endeavor. So the artist liberalis or the liberal education was really a combination of philosophy and the practical arts. Okay, while science was central to the Roman idea of being educated, science at that time was not really differentiated from philosophy. And so science was not considered as a practical art. Okay. The humanities in contrast, especially rhetoric, okay, and, and, and writing were considered to be as the practical art. One of the ideals of Roman citizenship is for you to be proficient in the arts, to be able to speak well, okay? to give orations. In fact, a lot of the surviving literature from the Roman uh, Empire okay, and the Roman Republic are of citizens of Roman philosophers who were very erudite, which means they could speak very well and write very well. Those have survived to the present day, and they have become ideals in the in Western culture of what an educated person should be. Now, of course, the Roman Empire eventually, uh, well, I couldn't say it collapsed. Uh, it's just the there were so many nation uh, new identities that were built by the subjects of the Roman Empire, which now became the forerunners of the European countries today. So by the time the European medieval ages, okay, uh, the people in France were identifying more as French rather as citizens of the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, citizens in Germany were identifying more as Germans, okay? but, but the national identities would come much, much later in, in European history. At this time, uh, it was the Roman Catholic Church who was a major influence in, in arts and in the sciences and in the humanities. And the reason is this, because when the Roman Empire collapsed, the, the political institutions with it the administrative uh, institutions with it also collapsed, except the Roman Catholic Church. 
Okay, so it's not really, uh, it's a cliche to say that the uh, Roman learning was actually preserved by the Roman Catholic Church. Even today, the government of the Vatican is essentially similar, very similar to the government of the Roman Empire. Okay? Even the word for Pope, okay, we call the Pope Pontiff. Okay? The word Pontiff means bridge builder in Latin. And Pontiff originally referred to the emperor. Okay? When the Roman Empire became Christian and the political power of the emperor started to wane, okay, or, or, so the role of being Pontiff to an organized society fell on the Pope. So by the time the European Middle Ages, uh, it is the it is the Christian the Catholic Church that was the dominant cultural force in Europe. And so they built all these nice cathedrals, okay, which still stand 800 years. It's, they have been standing for, all, some of them are standing for almost 800, it's 800 years. No? And so uh, if you have the chance to go to Europe, okay, uh, or if you have been in Europe, okay, if you don't, go and see the modern cultural sites. Of course, that's an important thing to do. Uh, what most people do is to look at the medieval monuments like the churches okay, to get to know what European heritage is all about. So when I was in Europe, and that's where the pandemic caught me, <laughs> or caught me and my graduate students, okay, uh, we had to cut down or uh, cut short our trip because we, Europe would go into a lockdown. So, but we, we, we risked a day of being stuck in Europe just to see the cathedrals. No? We said, uh, we've been to Europe and we didn't even see a medieval cathedral. We will regret it for the rest of our lives. Okay, I think we did the right thing because uh, who can go back to Europe right now, okay, given all these quarantine conditions. So we were able to see these cathedrals in France, in Germany, and in Spain. Okay which is an inheritance from the Middle Ages. Now, if you look at these cathedrals, you can see that uh, there are a lot of uh, engineering feet, architectural features. Uh, and later on, we'll talk about where did the Europeans get that? Now, it's not really completely indigenous to Europe. It was borrowed from other cultures. And that's so important. There's always cultural influence. Uh, the Cultures will share their ideas of art and science with other cultures, and other cultures will make it their own and adding up, adding, adding other features to these things that they have uh, borrowed from other cultures. Okay, now, uh, during this time, the, the Pope that was the only scientist until now, well, of course, uh, we have another scientist Pope now. The only scientist Pope uh, that time was Sylvester II, who was the mathematical pope. Okay? Uh, he brought in mathematics and science learning into Western Europe, and he was pope about a thousand years ago. The present pope is the second scientist pope, by the way, okay? uh, Francis. What I mean as a scientist pope is that uh, before becoming a priest, they spent a lot of time learning science and mathematics. Uh, Sylvester studied math and science before being ordained as a Catholic priest. Uh, similarly, Pope Francis uh, went that, that way. And they say that this Pope Sylvester studied in an Islamic university, although the evidence isn't really that convincing, but Muslims are claiming that they were instrumental in teaching a Pope mathematics. Okay, perhaps uh, Sylvester, when he was young, did not really go to Morocco. It is most likely that he had teachers who studied in Morocco, Muslim teachers who studied in Morocco, in this al Karawin de Fes, okay, which is the oldest Islamic university uh, in the world. By the way, this university is also a modern university. They teach the teach the subjects that we study in UP Diliman, no? But uh, one of their claims is really that a Pope was one of their uh, students. So since we're talking about the university, what then is a university? Okay. 
al Karawin of Fez is a university. It's a school. Okay. Fine. Okay. Of course, today it's known as a university. There is a difference between the universities that were established in medieval Europe and the other schools in other cultures like in, in, in Islam okay? or in, 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 the, in India okay? or in, in China. There were already uh, schools of higher education. Okay? But they were not universities in the sense that we know what a university is today. For example, the Islamic universities now are, of course, are modern. They can grant degrees. No, they, they, aside from Islamic studies and theology, they have schools of engineering, schools of medicine, schools of colleges of science, and even uh, college of economics. They they all have those faculties. No, but when those schools started, they were primarily religious schools. Okay. Uh, the Islamic universities that we have now, although now they, they offer all sorts of degrees, they started out as madrasas or Islamic schools that teach the Quran. Okay. But the universities that were established in medieval Europe, although they were established by the Catholic Church, Right from the start, they were not just teaching Catholic theology, although that's a major uh, aspect of a medieval university. They were also teaching philosophy. Okay? Philosophy in itself is not about religion. Okay? So they were teaching theology and philosophy. Okay? Of course, there is, uh, there is Christian philosophy. Okay? But philosophy itself is not really a, it's not really for uh, to further a religious idea, although it couldn't be used for such, no. So, uh, so it's not just religion, no. Unlike in the universities in the Islamic world at the in the medieval when they started, okay? and also the university so-called uh, schools in India and in uh, and in China, okay. Uh, in India, there is a so-called, uh, they called it, uh, they said that that's the oldest university is in India, but that university was a religious school associated with a Hindu temple. And one of them is associated with the Buddhist temple. They were not teaching uh, the sciences as we know it today. They were teaching about the Buddhist and Hindu religions. So what made the European medieval university quite different from those uh, centers of higher learning in the classical uh, in period? For one thing, the medieval university had an idea of academic freedom. And so what is this academic freedom? But before we get into that, so let's take a look at a painting that was made by a student in the medieval period. I think this was in the 13th century. So this is a medieval classroom. As you can see, you have the professor here teaching from a throne. The throne was called a chair. Okay. And so today, your professors in UP Diriman are occupying a metaphorical chair. Okay. The chair is funded. Okay. So the professor here gets a uh, an allowance for teaching. But of course, today the chair is actually funded by the national government in UP. No? Uh, and that's used to pay for the salaries of the teacher, of the professors. No? So the professor is sitting in a th on a throne called a chair, and the students are here. Okay, if you look at the, the seats, it's as if it was a church pew, because the classrooms were essentially the chapels of the Catholic University. But take a look at this picture here, okay? They were all wearing academic gowns because it was cold. So the tradition lives on today, but of course in UP, we decided to, to do away with that, no? So in other schools, they still wear the toga okay, or academic gown that is a direct descendant of the medieval gowns that the professors and the students wore. 
and the colors would represent the courses that they the disciplines that we they are uh, preparing for so we see people here in red they are probably studying to become doctors now let's look at the things that are interesting here okay students then and now are still sleeping in class they might be bored to death okay and they might be not paying attention so students have never changed in 800 years So of course, uh, throughout the Middle Ages, it became more formal. So you can see here a picture of a classroom uh, with a professor again on the on the chair reading from a book, and students are expected to listen to what the professor reads. And you have two masters here that co that uh, carry the mace of the college. The original use for the maze is to discipline students. So the master on the direction of the professor would say that, can you hit that student with the maze? Does the student that's not paying attention or the student that's sleeping in class? Okay. And, uh, and over the centuries, of course, that context has more or less disappeared. Today, the maze is the symbol of the university's authority to give degrees. So when you graduate, you would see that there's somebody carrying the maze of UP Diliman, which means UP Diliman has the authority to pronounce you as graduates. Now, of course, during that time, uh, I said it was only men that could go to college. And most of the men were preparing for the priesthood of the Catholic Church. Now, Pope Sylvester essentially required that priests should be well educated. And that has still been practiced today. Uh, how long does it take for a, for a man to become a Catholic priest? It takes a long time. It's about the same time it takes for you to become a, me uh, a medical doctor, which means that you have a residency, then, uh, then you can practice your profession. A priest takes along the, uh, the same length of time. But of course, uh, until today, the Catholic Church cannot, does not ordain women, no? but some of the other Christian churches do, like the Anglican Church. The Anglican Church uh, also requires its students uh, to become students who are studying for the priesthood to, to take courses also at the same, same length of time. So anyway, what is a university? Uh, in Latin, it is universitas magistrorum et scholarium, or a community of teachers and scholars. Now, I have to em emphasize the term community. So right from the start, there's always this idea of equality and democratic governance in a university. Of course, certain people have certain roles. No? Uh, so we have an administrative hierarchy. But still, the decisions in a university are more or less collegial. Okay? So nobody would just impose an idea over other people because he, he or she thinks that idea is right. The community should think that the idea is more or less right. So we call this academic freedom. Now, what is academic freedom? Okay, professors have their own freedoms. The first one is to determine what to teach. The second one is to determine whom to teach. And the third one is the freedom to do research and disseminate the results. Now, in any university, the body that sets the curriculum are actually the professors. Here in UP, uh, it's your departments that would set the curriculum for your studies, and that is approved collegially by the university council. Okay, and the university council is essentially made up of professors from all the colleges meeting as one body. 
Okay, the university council can determine whom to teach. A long time ago, the university council decided that UP should have an UPCAT exam. Okay, and that has more or less stayed, except for last year, in which the exam was waived. But the admission, the revised admission principles were agreed upon again by the university council because the university council has the freedom to determine whom to teach. And the professors have the, the freedom to determine what research to do. Students, however, have their own freedoms, which are complementary to the freedom of, of the professors. Uh, the students have the freedom to choose which course of study to pursue. Okay, now, uh, it should be that you as the student should be able to choose your own course so without much pressure from your family or friends or significant others. No? It's an individual decision because it's your life. No? Uh, decisions about your life should be determined by you. Okay, So um, actually, we professors have no right to tell you which course to study. It's up to you. No? So that's what a very important freedom. No? If you want to shift out of your course, that is part of your academic freedom also. However, that's not absolute because the, the college that you will shift to may have certain standards or, or rules before you can be admitted as a shifty. You have the right to be fairly assessed. Okay. And we have the right of freedom of expression in accordance with the law. Okay, freedom of expression is not absolute. Okay? In many universities, you just cannot uh, say that you want to kill people. Oh, that's uh, already a red flag, no? Uh, in fact, if one of your teachers uh, feel that you can be a threat to safety, it is perfectly legal for the professor to report you to the police, okay? So the point is, it's not really completely, uh, there's, it's not absolute. If our freedom to express our opinions is, uh, is threatening, let's say it's hate speech, or it's threatening to, it's a threat to the safety and life of persons, then that is not acceptable in a university. However, here in UP, we have a large degree of freedom of expression. Okay, before the pandemic, uh, some people of a certain fraternity would run naked around campus, right? That's part of the freedom of expression. And and that's not limited by the university. Okay. However, in other schools, and this, and this has been a Supreme Court case, uh, one, one conservative college uh, expelled a few of their women students because they went to Boracay and wore a bikini and posted it in social media. And the, the complicating factor here is that their parents actually were the ones who took the picture, which means uh, the parents actually consented to their uh, daughters being taken a photo of that, no? uh, wearing a bikini in Boracay. And they uploaded it to social media and it said that it violated the school's uh, policies and principles. No? Yeah, it, it became a very, uh, very, controversial case, no? Anyway, it only means one thing. That school had a, a smaller uh, degree of uh, freedom of expression as compared to, to UP, okay? You won't get expelled from UP by wearing a swimsuit or a bikini and posting it in social media, okay? Uh, there are other ways that you can get out of UP, but, but wearing those swimwear is, uh, I think, is not really one of them, okay? So we have a wide range of freedom of expression in UP. However, what is really illegal? Right? Universities or the government sanctioning the professors or students because of political ideas. 
and ideological ideas. Or even religious ideas, no? Uh, in UP, we have freedom of worship, no? Uh, you can't get expelled from UP because you are a member of a particular religious group and you're telling other students about your, your faith. Of course, you cannot do that inside the classroom being uh, we are a secular university. But uh, we have the freedom on campus to do that. And also the freedom to say that you don't believe in any God or you, you don't adhere to any religious tradition. So you cannot be sanctioned for that for your support of certain uh, political ideologies. You can support Marxism, okay? You should never be sanctioned for that. You can support liberal, uh, the liber a liberal party, <laughs> not the liberal party, a party, a liberal party, okay? Or a socialist party. So you should not be sanctioned for that. If you are sanctioned by the university for that, then that is actually a violation of your academic freedom. Now, uh, since UP borrowed a lot of its traditions from the Americans, okay, the Americans uh, pursued the liberal education idea, which they borrowed from England. So remember that the US consisted of colonies that used to be part of, part of the UK or the United Kingdom. And so the settlers of the 13 original colonies were all uh, from the mother country, from England. So the first U.S. universities were Protestant because at that time, um, England was already a Protestant country. And so the curriculum was about God and the Greeks. So there's a focus on Protestant uh, theology and the Greek classics. Okay? Later on, there was philosophy, then the sciences. So Harvard was a Protestant Puritan university, while Yale was congregational. These are the Ivy League universities. And Columbia was an Anglican university. Now, even then, they went back to the question, what is the purpose of education? For Yale, it is not to teach that is peculiar to any of the professions, but to lay the foundations common to them all. So it's more of a generalist liberal education. Okay? More, more focusing on the development of virtue in their students. So it's more arete oriented. Harvard, on the other hand, was more practical. According to Charles Elliott, who was a president of Harvard, I want to give him, okay, it's a male, remember only, only men could go into universities at that time. I want to give him a practical education, one that will prepare him better than I, as I, I was prepared to follow my business or any other calling. In other words, uh, education is to prepare you to a particular profession. Okay. So more on the practice of a profession rather than instilling virtues in a student. Now, uh, about the same time uh, in England, okay, uh, there was a cardinal called John Henry Newman who used to be an Anglican priest but decided to convert to the Catholic Church. Now, when he was an Anglican priest, he was already known as a scholar and a theologian. When he became a Catholic, uh, he got an assignment to set up a Catholic university in Ireland. When he was setting it up, he had developed his ideas of liberal education that is more particular to the 19th century. However, some of Newman's ideas have relevance to even today in the 21st century. So he wrote an, an essay called The Idea of a University. Okay. This was an idea of university during the 19th century when science was becoming a very dominant uh, force in human society and religion was taking a retreat. Okay? Remember, uh, throughout the centuries in Europe, uh, there was a focus on religion and philosophy. Okay? 
science just came out a little bit later. Okay, but uh, in the 19th century, science was becoming a a very uh, dominant uh, influence in education. Okay, Cardinal Newman did not really oppose the teaching of sciences. Uh, he said that it's very important also. If we could relate the sciences in to the liberal education idea, which uh, dates back in, from the Greeks and the Romans, and of course, in the medieval Catholic universities. According to Cardinal Newman, all branches of knowledge are connected together because the subject matter of knowledge are, is intimately united in itself. The process of training by which the intellect, instead of being formed or sacrificed to some particular or accidental purpose, some specific trade or profession or study or science is disciplined for its own sake, for this perception of its own proper object and for its own highest culture, and that is called liberal education. So it's not just for Cardinal Newman, it's not just developing individual virtues, but social virtues also. Especially the educated person's contribution to culture. And for science, liberal education is supposed to discipline your own mind. So that's a very 19th century or Victorian ideal because uh, Newman uh, lived during a time when Queen Victoria was the monarch in England. So there's this purpose. No? And if we reflect on these things, okay, uh, why do we study? Why do you have to study science, study your engineering? Is it just for our profession? Okay, that's fine. Or are, are we going to use it to discipline our own minds? Okay. So we can contribute to global human culture and definitely for the good of, all, of our human community. That is the purpose of liberal education, according to Cardinal Newman. And for Cardinal Newman, society requires some other contribution from each individual besides the particular duties of his profession. I think this is, this is still very relevant for us. Uh, well, whatever your course of study, be it in the arts or in mass communication or economic statistics or engineering or the natural sciences or in the social sciences, your value to society as a person is not just limited to what professional skills you can contribute, but also beyond what you can contribute, let's say, as an engineer. <laughs> Or, or a chemistry major, or uh, as an economist, or uh, somebody who is practicing as a professional sports uh, trainer. Okay, it's not just that. Okay, there's more to you than that. So that is uh, Cardinal Newman's idea. The object is really to contribute something good to human culture. So I think we can think about that throughout the whole STS course. So science and liberal education, as Newman said, it has, it's really part, it's important in order for, for, for us to have a wider view and also to discipline our minds. Now, science cannot be separated from what we call the humanistic whole because science is part of the achievements of human culture. And so it, it's, it is actually, a, it won't do us justice if we just focus on our particular specialties in our disciplines. We have to go beyond it and understand the interconnections and the complexities and wonders of our human society. Uh, we need to recover the so-called humanistic whole. Okay, we still a challenge to a liberal education and education in general. So every time there's always a debate in UP about the direction of our GE program, okay? And it should reflect the nature of the changing times, no? Uh, some of the GE disciplines that we had before are not really, no longer that relevant, okay? To, to the GE disciplines that we have now. 
for instance, let me give an example. Part of the GE program uh, a long time ago when my parents were studying in UP, you know, uh, merong nat, nat sci. Okay, you have your nat sci one, which is the physical sciences. Uh, nat sci two. Okay, I think that's the geological sciences, and three, which is the biological sciences. No. At that time, that was actually uh, the in thing. Okay, you study biology, geology and the physical sciences separately but now it's no longer it's no longer that no uh, all of these sciences are inter interconnected to understand a problem like global warming you should need bio you should know a, you should know the concepts of physics chemistry and biology and also the concepts that are taught in the social sciences in order to come up with a, an understanding on how to deal with the problem of climate change so that's why uh, NATSAI is no longer taught in UP Diliman. Okay? We have replaced it with other more integrative GE courses. And in doing that, we are, come, we are achieving a sort of more holistic view, a humanistic pull to the concepts of science and technology and the arts. So STS is actually about the social, political, and cultural values affecting scientific research and technological innovation, and how these things interact, okay? Society, politics, and culture. And so, um, how do science and technology impacts on society, okay? Uh, the impacts are on culture, values, and institutions, and that is so important in our STS courses now. Uh, we just we need to understand, especially if it's grounded on real life problems like the pandemic, for instance, how such things, culture, values, and institutions interact. So we're going to look into that in this STS course. Okay, so if we are too specialized, we will lose the humanistic rule. And if we use the humanistic cool, we cannot contribute much to as much as we can to human culture. And human culture is the thing that we need to protect. Okay? Uh, there are a lot of interests that would like to belittle culture okay? and education. And that is a threat to liberty because uh, um, even Rizal, Dr. Rizal knew that if, you're, uh, if society is ignorant, then it would be easily enslaved. So we don't want that because remember, Rizal was uh, educated in a more classical way. He knew that one of the responsibilities of an educated person is to be free. I think that remains valid today. And so that's why we have liberal education in this university. So I think that's about it for the first lecture. And uh, I want to wish you a good day and whatever you're doing, keep safe and be well. Thank you.